Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Zara and today I am going to be doing a non-spoiler and a spoiler-filled review of The Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. This video is going to be slightly different in terms of just how I talk about this book. I don't often do like non-spoiler and spoiler-filled reviews in the same video and I think also a lot of my spoiler reviews have been about books and series that I haven't actually enjoyed reading and that's why they kind of become a bit of a rant. This is going to be the opposite of a rant. I don't really know what the word is for the opposite of a rant, um, but this is going to be like a positive video. I'm going to spend some time going through my notes that I made on my Kindle. And uh, with, before that, though, I will just do a very brief kind of overview of what I really loved about this book, because as I mentioned in one of my previous videos, this series has been on my list and Hob has been on my list for a very long time, like it was since I was a teenager. I heard about her works and I've been eagerly anticipating for the day that when I would eventually pick her stuff up. But I've always been very nervous as well because this series and this writer are very hyped and I've often had very negative experiences with hyped books. But in this instance, it actually worked. The good thing about this situation as well is that I had already heard about this series prior to becoming a part of the book community on YouTube. So even though a lot of that hype has come from, you know, folks that I've spoken to. I think because I'd, I was already aware of it prior to me even really using YouTube as much as I do today, I think that maybe helped kind of temper my expectations as well. So without further ado, I'm not going to bother doing a synopsis of this book because I don't think there's any point. And I actually didn't really know anything about this series in the sense that obviously I know there was some sort of assassin element because it is literally called The Assassin's Apprentice. But I didn't know anything beyond that. I didn't really know anything about what sort of tropes it had or anything like that. So uh, I think, honestly, it's probably best to go into any series like that. But I think especially hype series like this, go into it with very little expectation. And plus, I feel like everybody has read this book and this series and I'm pretty late to the party. So there we go. So anyway, I'm going to start off with a couple of minutes just talking about my non-spoiler thoughts. And then I am going to just go through my Kindle notes and highlights and I don't know how long this video is going to be. This video could possibly be like 40 minutes long. I, I want to do more longer videos talking about books and series that I love rather than just reserving that for books that I haven't enjoyed. And to be fair, I have done quite a few long videos on books that I've loved, but I want to do more of that because I would like to share more positivity into the world because we already have enough negativity. In terms of what I loved about this, and I don't have any notes prepared for this video because I want it to be very casual, but in terms of what I loved about this book is I just, I just think Robin Hobb is an absolutely phenomenal writer. Like she's just so damn talented. It is insane how beautifully her writing flows. I wouldn't say it's like the most complex or lyrical even writing that I've ever read, but I think it works. I think it's a really good balance of like being descriptive, but not being overly descriptive, which is an issue that I've had with previous fantasy authors that I've read, like Robert Jordan, even Tolkien to an extent. I think there is a balance that you need to keep. And I think she kept that balance really, really well in this first book. I will talk more about like specific language that she uses in my spoiler filled section, but I just think it's just really, really nice to read. One of the things that I said to my Patreons as I started reading it was that I find it very relaxing to read her work partially because we are following Fitz in his day-to-day -day life and it's quite like mundane stuff that we're witnessing. So that in itself makes it quite relaxing, but also just the tone of the writing and the way that the writing flows also makes it incredibly relaxing. I said to my patrons yesterday at the time that I'm filming this video that her writing actually puts me to sleep. And that is honestly one of the best compliments I could ever give to somebody because I find it quite hard to drop off sometimes. So the fact that her writing literally puts me to sleep is just like, I, I don't think I could give a better compliment <laughs> in terms of like how relaxing the writing is. So I, I love the writing. It's so nice to read. It is an absolute pleasure to read. And I think anybody who wants to be a writer, whether it's fantasy or any other genre, like I think this is a series and an author that you absolutely must read because she's incredibly, incredibly talented at it. The characters, I'm not going to talk about any specific characters right now, but there are so many great characters 
so many great characters and watch later if you've read this series and you want to hear my thoughts on specific characters but there's so many so many so many like our main character is just I, I don't normally like following younger characters I've talked about this before I just don't find it as engaging now that's not to say that I'm against reading younger characters because obviously I'm not because Fitz I think at the start of this book he's like 10 11 right going into his teen years as well and so he's very young but He's very, like, relatable. I feel like the way that Hob captured his youth is very realistic. I find a lot of times in fantasy specifically, younger characters are either really young in the sense that they literally sound like five-year-olds or they are extremely adult in the way that they approach things. So they're just very unrelatable. And yes, that could be because the situation has forced them to grow up. I totally get that. I think oftentimes I found the characters to be quite one note when they're a child. But I think Fitz actually has quite a lot of layers. And I think part of the reason why I've really enjoyed his characterization so far is because we really see him grow and we really see him learn and we see that in the context of his everyday life. Like, it's not just like the moments where he's, you know, doing really well. Like, we see every single aspect of his life and that grounds his character in reality. There is also an extremely wide cast of characters. The villains in this book, oh my gosh, they made my blood boil. And that is what I want from my villains. I don't want them to be mustache twirly villains that you kind of find quite funny because they're kind of ridiculous. They're not like that in this book. We have two main villains in this book. And again, I'll talk more about them in my spoiler filled section. And they are genuinely, genuinely awful people. And I wanted to hit them both because they're both like just evil. The characters are just so well fleshed out. They all feel very individual. They all feel very realistic and they all feel like characters that I want to follow for the next, you know, two books, but then also for the next series as well because Realm of the Elderlings is all a very interconnected world. I'm just excited to see where all these characters end up, where they're all going, where they're all starting off from, which we are at right now. In terms of the themes, I think there's some really great thematic work that isn't necessarily new to fantasy, but it doesn't always need to be new, right? I think it just needs to be a well thought out take. And I think the central theme of this book is around like family and like finding your place, being an outcast, being someone who is different and being someone who is trying to figure out who they actually are while being treated different by other people, whether that's because you're a bastard, which Fitz is. He was born out of wedlock and his father is a prince and he's the king in waiting. You know, he's somebody of a, a very high level of standing in society, but we see how Fitz both benefits from that, but also how that works against him in many ways, simply because he is a bastard. I think one of the best things about the way that Hobb handled this is because we see everything from Fitz's point of view, right? And we see the kind of very mundane actions that other characters do to him that make him feel worthless, that make him feel less than. And it's not like necessarily people outrightly bullying him, even though that does happen, but it's just the little minor things, people whispering about him, people making little comments, people ignoring him, like just the little small things that maybe you could dismiss if one of them was happening isolated, but when they're all happening at the same time, coupled together, you can tell that there is definitely an agenda against him. And that's all not through his own fault. He's a, a child at the start of this series. He has no say, you know, when he's born or who he's born to, none of us are. And I think it's really interesting seeing him having to live through the consequence of his father's and his mother's actions. So I think that is is definitely the kind of central theme. There's also uh, the idea of being cast out of society because you have certain magical skills. Like this book is a book for people who have ever felt different, who have ever felt outcast because of a specific characteristic or because of their standing in society. And I feel like everybody could probably relate to that in some regard. This is about a boy who purely through circumstance is in a situation that he probably doesn't want to be in, but he kind of has to be because of what society expects of him. 
I think it's handled very delicately. I think it's handled in a way that is very subtle. And there's a lot of little details and cues that you can pick up on as the reader if you're really paying attention to what is happening. There's also like a decent amount of politics and we're getting the lay of the land as Fitz goes into court and kind of sees what's happening with the king and his sons and like his interactions with them. Like there's a lot of different things going on by the end of the first book that by the time we get to the second book, which picks up pretty much straight after the events of book one, like there's so much setting that has been done that now, you know, as the reader, I'm just so excited to see where it goes next. So I'm going to pause there in terms of my non-spoiler section. So if you haven't read the series and you don't want to hear my extremely detailed thoughts about this book, feel free to come back to this later when you do read it. But now we're going to go through my Kindle notes. I don't know if I'm going to go through every single one because there are a lot of them. And yeah, we're just going to kind of talk through it. We're going to have a chat. We're just going to keep it easy breezy, you know, just like have a bit of fun. Like I, I, I do like sitting down here and just talking about a book like in detail. Like I said, I, I think oftentimes that happens when it is a badly written book, at least in my opinion, or I haven't enjoyed it for whatever reason. But this is a book that I've loved and I would like to do the same for this. So yeah, let's jump in. So um, I'm not going to go necessarily through chapter by chapter, but I'm just going to kind of flick through my notes and kind of pick up on things. We'll talk about specific characters, specific plot points, uh, the writing as well. Let's get started. One of the great things about this book, the way that it starts out, is one of the first quotes that we get from the perspective of Fitz, because Fitz is obviously telling this story retrospectively, is my life has been a web of secrets, secrets that even now are unsafe to share already we get the tone set, already we get a sense that this person has lived through a lot and this story that he's going to be telling us is in itself going to be barely scraping the surface and we're going to be hitting upon layers upon layers of what this person has gone through both in terms of their experiences but also what they felt emotionally and how this has impacted them as an individual. So it already sets like a very kind of intriguing tone because we don't obviously know what has happened. At least I had no idea, you know, what this book was about going into it. So it kind of sets this mystery that we're all kind of waiting to unpack as the book progresses. In terms of the writing, one of my first initial quotes that I kind of highlighted was this. And I just think it shows how beautiful her writing is. And that is the chill greyness of the fading day, the remorseless rain that soaked me, the icy cobbles of the strange town streets, even the calloused roughness of the huge hand that gripped my small one. Like that is just stunning, stunning, so beautiful. And look how she uses descriptive words, right? But it doesn't detract too much. Like it's just, it it, it adds a layer of depth to what is, is the kind of the picture of the scene but it doesn't do it in a way that is extremely convoluted. So talented. Then we get a bit of context on Prince Chivalry. I'm gonna skip through a few things, by the way. I, ha I highlighted a lot. Um, so for the sake of time, we will skip through some stuff. Then we get a bit of information on Prince Chivalry. And we learn that Fitz is the only son that he has, the only child that he has. Interestingly, at this point, Fitz doesn't even have a name, right? Fitz is given the name a little bit later on into the book. And so he's this nameless child and he only really gets that name until somebody else names him who isn't his parents, which I also thought was quite interesting. The interesting thing about chivalry is one of the first things that we learn about him is, is that he never had a child prior to fit, which is interesting because he is obviously the king in waiting. But then later on, as the book progresses, we get more and more tidbits about Chivalry's character and how honourable he was, how intelligent he was. But it's interesting that the first thing that we learn about him is that Fitz is his only child and that he obviously didn't have that child through his wife, who is the queen in waiting. Then we get some more really nice world building, like this one as an example. The quantity of furniture in it, rugs and hangings and shelves of tablets and scrolls overlaid with, with the scattering of clutter that any well-used and comfortable chamber takes on. There was a fire burning in a massive fireplace, filling the room with heat and a pleasantly resinous scent. Oh my gosh, it's stunning. Absolutely stunning. Such simple, like, vo vocabulary as well. It's not as if she uses, like, overly complicated words which 
doesn't necessarily mean, you know, beautiful writing, but I think she is like very good proof that you don't need to use overly flowery words to like paint a beautiful setting. Then we get some perspective from Fitz and he says, I do not know if I was merely repeating what he and the guardsman had called me or if I truly had no name besides the word. And it's interesting, the note that I put next to this was trauma. <laughs> because that, I mean, that that is quite traumatic, right? Like you don't even have a name. And then when you do get a name, it's purely because you are being recognised as the son of the potential future king. It's pretty traumatic in my opinion. Then we get some more amazing world building. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to be kind of going through my list. This is just, again, it's just so sumptuous. And this is probably the last bit of world building that I mentioned, because otherwise I'll just end up reading the whole book. And that is, the room smelled of food, of beer and men's sweat, of wet wool garments and the smoke of the wood and drip of grease into flames. Hogs' heads and small casts ranged against the wall and smoked joints of meat were dark shapes hung from the rafters. Like, I can literally, like, grasp that image in my head. Amazing. Then one of the kind of things that we get from Fitz's perspective is we start to learn more about his character and what spirit he already has in him. So I stared back at him with as much defiance as I could muster and saw his upset mask suddenly with a sort of reluctant wonder. So we're seeing that he has a bit of fight and then we're seeing that He's also quite good on picking up external cues from people, even though he's still very young, quite an observant individual. Then we get Fitz being put into the, I, don't, I forgot what you call them, but like basically where all the animals are. And then he talks about how like the warmth of the hounds and the prickling straw like make him feel comfortable. And that here we're already starting to get a sense that he has an affinity to animals. I really loved the animal companions in this book. Lots of emotional moments with his animal companions that we'll talk about later. But it's, it's like, I think she did Animal Companions extremely, extremely well. Then we get uh, our first introduction to the awful, awful Regal. And there's a conversation between Regal and his brother. And he says to him, I'm well aware that you precede me. You need not flaunt it at me at every opportunity, Regal said coldly. And I actually wrote in my note, trouble is brewing. And we already, just from this first interaction between Regal and his brother, we already get a sense that he is a very entitled, very kind of bitter individual. He thinks he has owned the throne and we get more of that as the book progresses. He's a horrible, horrible individual. He is just incorrigible. I detest his character, but he's very, very well written. I do have a feeling that he will become king at some point. There's just something in me, my spidey sense is tingling, that he will become king at some point. And I think Fitz will probably become outcast and then, you know, he'll have to fight back against Regal. Uh, that's my theory, but I have no clue if that theory is correct. Please don't tell me if it is because I do not want to know. And then to add further to that, one of the things that he says is, what if he chooses to recognise this boy, referring to chivalry? It could be very divisive to the nobles. Why should we tempt trouble? Again, it just shows that he's very self-centred. He only cares about himself and that he's really only focused on self-preservation above anything else. We then get uh, another kind of internal thought from Fitz uh, about how he did actually meet his father at one point, but he has no memory of meeting his father, which and I think I think in itself is also very telling, right? Like he meets his father for the first time, but he has no kind of recollection of that interaction, which I think tells you something about chivalry, maybe about the lack of warmth that he had towards his son. But also I feel like this is a coping mechanism for Fitz as well, because at this point he doesn't know whether he's ever going to see his father again. And maybe that's a way of him subconsciously trying to prepare for that. So by kind of taking that memory out of his head or suppressing that memory out of his mind, he's protecting himself. And again, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion around trauma in this series because we're already seeing this character display certain tendencies that indicate that. And I think anybody who was a child who might have been in that situation could possibly relate to that as well. Then we get some more comings and goings with Fitz and kind of what he's up to. We get more time with Nosy and I, I adore Nosy. And when Nosy passes later on in the book, I was utterly, utterly heartbroken. So sad. I did know that Burrick hadn't killed him because I feel like Burrick would never do that. It just it felt very out of character. But I didn't know that he was going to come up later on in this book, which I loved for Fitz because it just felt like such a beautiful reunion. But then obviously he dies as well. But one of the things that we get here, and this was, I actually wrote this in my, my note, was 
Nosy bowled over me a half a dozen times before I could convey to his thick skulled hound's mind. And I wrote, can he communicate with animals? So we already get from the start this indication that Fitz has this affinity to animals, that he's, he has this ability to communicate with animals, which is such a cool magic skill. Like, I think that would be such a cool, like, skill to have. Like, I'd love to be able to do that. And we see this kind of get built upon as we progress throughout the book. We get some more beautiful imagery, like, I'm just going to read this out because I actually wrote in my note, lovely. And it is lovely. Despite our long nap earlier, the blankets so close to the fire were suddenly immensely inviting. Bellies full, we curled up with the flames, baking our backs and slept. Like, does that not make you just want to go and lie in your bed and like have a fire burning? Like it just, it's just beautiful. So beautiful. Continuing on this like theme around like trauma, especially like childhood trauma, we get a character called Molly who becomes Fitz's love interest. And there's one bit where she says, he hits me a bit when I am bad, but he'd never kill me. And when he is sober and not sick, he cries about it and begs me not to be too bad and make him angry. And again, we, I think we're seeing a lot of very damaged children, again, through no fault of their own, having to come to terms with things that are very adult in nature. And Molly, I'll talk more about her later on as the book progresses, but like, it's so heartbreaking to hear her justify her father's behaviour. And I think that's partly because it is only them two. If maybe she had her mother or a sibling, maybe she would have a different perspective. But I think she's also a child, right? So she doesn't know how to rationalise what is actually happening. So in her mind, she's justifying it automatically. It's so sad to read that because it's almost quite deluded, but you can't fault her for it because she is a literal child. And there is also this discussion around like how, I wouldn't say it's a discussion, but there is this constant referencing about how these children are very fearless. Uh, Fitz says about himself, I don't think I've ever been as brave since I was then. And I think that is because children have a fearlessness that adults kind of don't have. I think that gets eroded over time because we are told that we have to fit into certain expectations, whether that's societal, cultural or otherwise. But children don't really factor any of that into account. They don't think about like what society is going to say about them. They don't think about this, that or the other. They just care about that, what's going on in their own little world, right? I think that starts to change when you become like a teenager and you get exposed to you know, maybe the real world. At this point, he's still extremely young. And I do think that just shows that he has this strength that probably outweighs most adults' strength, which is interesting in itself. We then get more kind of allusion to Nosy and Fitz having a connection, which I really liked how she approached this. I really liked how it's very subtle. It wasn't too in your face, but if you're paying attention, you can definitely pick up on it. At this point, we obviously don't know it's a negative thing. Later, we learn that this is seen as like a disgrace. Like if you have this power to be able to communicate with animals, it's actually like incredibly dangerous because society sees that as a horrible, dangerous thing. We don't know why at this point, uh, unless I missed it, but I did look out for this, like, why is it seen as such a negative thing? But we haven't actually found out like why having the skill, the ability to communicate with animals is bad. If anybody has more colour on this, specifically as it relates to book one, feel free to tell me down below. But if this comes up later on in the series, don't tell me because I would like to learn it myself. But you can tell me if it comes up later on as well. Like as an example, we get from Burrick, he says, it's bad, very bad. What you've been doing with this pup It's unnatural. It's worse than stealing or lying. It makes a man less than a man. Do you understand me? Like at this point, we haven't actually learned why you are less than a man if you're communicating with animals. I mean, I think that's sick. I would love that skill. Then we keep going. So this affliction of being able to communicate with animals is called the wit get a bit more from Burrick about how is the power of the beast blood. Just as the skill comes from the line of kings, it starts out like a blessing, giving you the tongues of the animals, but then it seizes you and draws you down, makes you dot, dot, dot. I mean, that, I guess, is an explanation, but we don't know more than that right now. We don't know more about how, like, the wit kind of became a thing. We do get some little bits and pieces from Fitz, like, from his, you know, the beginnings of each uh, chapter where he kind of, talks as an adult like we get little bits here and there but we haven't had uh, that much I think so I hope we get more learnings on that we then get this really interesting line in this conversation that Fitz and Burrick are having with each other when he's trying to like edge himself towards like Burrick's feelings and emotions he says but this time my defense was met by a wall that hurled it back at me 
And it made me think, like, there's definitely something going on with Burrick that we are unaware of at, at this point in book one. Like, obviously, having read the whole book now, like, we don't know much about Burrick, like, how he came to be Chivalry's right hand. He definitely has some sort of power. I have a feeling it is the wit, but maybe he found a way to kind of dampen down the wit or like maybe he found a way to temper it or something. I don't know, but I just, there's something going on with him. And again, we get these little, little hints throughout the book and I'm just waiting to see what it is. He also heals very quickly. I feel like Burrick, like Burrick is quite old from what I understand. I don't know how old specifically, but he reads to me like he's in his 40s or 50s, which isn't old by any means, but it's obviously older than fit. But the way that he like heals really quickly makes me think as well that there is definitely something going on with him. It just feels like we're missing a piece here, which I'm excited to learn more about. The scene where we think Nosy was killed is so heartbreaking. There was a sudden flash of red pain and Nosy was gone. As his canine senses deserted me completely, I screamed and cried as any six-year-old. He's six years old, not 10 years old. As any six-year-old might and hammered vainly at the thick wood planks. Oh my gosh, it's so heartbreaking. I literally stopped reading at this point because bear in mind, we haven't known Nosy that much, but because we're seeing Nosy through Fitz's eyes and we're getting this very like playful sense of their relationship, it's just so heartbreaking to read that. And again, like anybody who's been a child who's had a, an animal with them all the time and then that animal just goes, like it's, it's horrible, absolutely horrible. We're gonna push forward a little bit because I am definitely still i haven't even got to halfway of my notes yet a few couple of quotes that i really loved is it the nature of the world that all things seek a rhythm and in that rhythm a source of peace what what is that it's beautiful then we'll keep going i really love this quote as well actually uh all events no matter how earth-shaking or bizarre are diluted within moments of their occurrence by the continuance of the necessary routines of day-to-day -day living like this is so true right like you could be given a piece of horrible news but then somebody will knock on your door and post your letters and your packages and like the world keeps moving regardless of what is happening in your life and i think that is captured so beautifully in this quote we learn a little bit more about regal we get some kind of observations from Fitz, and what he talks about is how regal was capable of a pettiness and vindictiveness that i never encountered in verity verity is the second son and I really like Verity's character. I, I actually think he's one of my favourite characters in this book. There is another character that is like joint first with him. But I just, I really warm to his character because I think he's trying his hardest. He was never meant to be king. And yet he's put into a position, obviously, after chivalry passes or let's say he was murdered. He was never really trained for. He was never really prepared to do because he was never meant to be in that role. And it's so interesting seeing him kind of step up to that role, at least in this first book. I just loved his interactions with Fitz because I think he truly respects him. He almost sees him as a son. It'll be interesting to see if he has his own children at some point and how his relationship with Fitz changes as that happens. But I love their connection. I love how he treats him like an equal as well, like when he starts to teach him about the skill. And yeah, I'm, I'm here for their dynamic and I really hope their dynamic stays this way. Like I hope they don't turn against each other because I think that would be really heartbreaking. So we're seeing Regal in contrast to Verity, right? Verity is a very honorable man, I think, and he is intelligent but he has a different type of intelligence compared to say Regal, who is very charismatic and good at getting people on his side because he's very manipulative versus Chivalry, who's very intelligent in terms of like tactics and politics and things like that. Verity is like somewhere in the middle. He's a bit awkward, but in a way his awkwardness endears him to people, I think. But he is also smart. Like he, he shows nuggets of wisdom throughout this book. And uh, I am really curious to see how that continues. Like, I really hope he does become king and we see him as king, but I have a feeling that he is going to get killed and Regal will become king and that will kind of instigate a bunch of events. But I don't know, I'm just, I'm just guessing here. Then we get a little bit of insight into the old king as well. And he's also a very smart individual. Like one of my favorite quotes of his is when he talks about how he wants to utilize Fitz as like, 
a weapon for the family. So he says, instead of a discontented bastard who may be persuaded to become a pretender to the throne, he will be a henchman, united to the family by spirit as well as blood. Like, I, lo I love that. Like, I mean, obviously, it's quite manipulative how he's trying to weaponize a child, like a literal six-year-old. But I love also how intelligent he is because he's right. Like, better to create him... Uh, as part of the throne's vision, right? Rather than just leave him or kill him off. Like he can actually become something that is useful. Obviously that's harsh because he's a six year old and he's literally talking about him as though he's a weapon. But just from his perspective, it's smart. It's a smart thing to do. All right, we're gonna keep going. Another quote that I loved. I've since come to know that many men always see another's good fortune as a slight to themselves. So true. I've experienced that myself. It applies to everybody. Such a true quote. Another quote that was really great uh, that I actually posted in my Patreon when I read it because it's such a great quote. A ruler must be all of his people for one can only rule what one knows. It's true. It's true. All right. We're gonna go back. All right, let's progress through a little bit. I want to talk about some stuff that actually happens. The thing is about this book, not a lot actually happens. Like there aren't tons of action. There isn't tons of stuff happening. It's really setting the scene for this character and like the world and the, the other characters and how they're all going to be working or working working with or working against each other. And that's what I love about this book is that not a ton happens. And yeah, it's one of the best books I've ever read. The one bit that I found really funny is when Fitz gets fitted for new clothes. He says, I found myself up on a stool being turned and measured and hummed over with no regard for my dignity or indeed my humanity. I mean, that's quite sad, but it's also quite funny because he's literally being like forced to like turn around and do stuff so that he can get fitted clothes. I just thought that was so funny. One of the other key themes about this book that I didn't talk about earlier was loneliness. Like there's a steady thread of how each of our characters are almost quite isolated, not just fit, but I think other characters also feel quite isolated in their own ways. Like I think Verity definitely has moments of that where nobody really understands him and he feels kind of like he's by himself. We also get that with Molly to an extent. We also get that with some other characters as well. Burrick, I think, is a really good example of that too. After Chivalry dies, like he feels like he's lost a part of himself. So there is this recurring theme of loneliness. And one of the things that uh, Fitz says, and I think a lot of people can probably relate to this, despite my schedule, I found myself mostly alone. Loneliness. Like, again, it shows that our character, even though he's been intentionally or unintentionally given this illusion of togetherness and being a part of this family or this community he's never felt more alone and obviously he doesn't have nosy at this point as well so he has nobody or nothing to lean on which is really sad all right we're gonna push forward one other quote that i really liked and i think sh shows how interesting this like society is run is this quote, the welfare of the people belongs to the people and they have the right to object if their duke stewards it poorly. And I think it's Verity who says this. And I, I think, again, that's very telling of his character, but I think it also points to another, not necessarily a theme, but it shows a really interesting thing about the society, about how the rulers are there for the people. And I, I know that sounds very novel in today's society because I don't think there's any rulers today, any prime ministers, government officials, monarchs, nothing who maybe apart from spain as it relates to the monarch but like in general the vast majority of monarchies and you know government officials government representatives they don't think that the welfare of the people is the most important thing they don't that is just 100 percent categorically untrue they may say it now and then for a soundbite but that is a lie right and i think it's just such an interesting contrast when we hear people like Verity saying this in this book and it feels very like idealistic in a way uh because when he was saying this or whenever whichever character was saying this I was like yeah you're just saying that but that's actually true in this world there are people who believe that the welfare of the people takes priority and if the stewards are not protecting the people and taking care of their welfare then they should be punished for that right such a novel idea, who would have thought? Another thing that I really like about Fitz's character, about how he's quite quiet and how he's often reprimanded for not saying something, even though he doesn't have anything to speak. Again, relating it back to modern society, you can be somebody who's quite quiet and let's say like you're in a meeting. Like I've had this before, like I've had like managers in the past. It doesn't happen anymore. I think uh, having a lot more when I was younger and early on in my career, 
I'm not one of those people that speaks for the sake of speaking. If I don't have anything to say or, an, or anything of value to add, I won't say anything because I just, I, like, why would I, right? <laughs> like, it's just such a, like, again, novel idea that you wouldn't say something for the sake of it. And Fitz is like that as well. And this is why I relate to this character so much because he says, my silence is he mistook for a lack of wit rather than a lack of any need to speak. Like, how relatable is that, right? Like, people who are quieter are forced to be loud and forced to say things that they don't want to say just to make people who are loud and annoying feel better about themselves. Like, it's it's so irritating. Ah, oh, Fitz just captures it perfectly. I put ha 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 <laughs> after this quote. Barak says to Fitz uh, this, and it's so funny. You look an imbecile sitting there nodding with your mind elsewhere. Don't fancy no one notices when you do that and don't glare like that when you're corrected. Sit up straight and put a pleasant expression on your face, not a vacuous smile, you dolt. <laughs> that's so mean. I mean, that's the thing. I think you can be quiet without looking passive, right? Like you can, you can be paying attention without saying anything. I think sometimes because he's a literal child, his attention wanes, which is fine. It happens. We then get some interaction with Chade. Chade we get introduced to earlier, but I think there's one particular quote that we get from the perspective of Fitz about Chade. And he says, he had a bluff heartiness to him that I enjoy, an attitude that things must be going well unless someone had told him otherwise, which I really like. And I think given Chade's role, given that he's this kind of like secret person that nobody really knows exists, he's the brother, half brother, I believe of the king. He's also a bastard. He kind of has this very like no nonsense approach to life that I really appreciate and that I think marries well with the sort of person and the sort of people in general that Fitz needs in his life, right? Because he's surrounded by a lot of like quite horrible people that treat him quite badly. But Chade can relate to him and he can relate to Chade because in a way they're in quite similar situations. And I think later on in the book, uh, Fitz actually says like, is, is, is this how I'm going to be? Am I going to be like Chade? in the future and I don't think so because I think obviously there's a lot more going on with Fitz that we haven't really unearthed yet but I do I do really like their relationship and I think Chade is quite a weird one like when he becomes the he kind of takes on that persona of being the aunt I forgot her name I'm sure it'll come up later on like so so funny so funny I did not see that coming as well, by the way. I did not see that that would be Chade, but I just thought it was hilarious. There's also a lot more to his story as well. Like, I think he has a he has a lot more power than maybe we realise. I like how he talks about other characters as well. Like, you can tell Galen that he just does not like Galen. And we'll come on to Galen in a minute. But yeah, he's just really really well written character i hope we get more time with them and i hope we learn more about his journey as well this is another really funny quote sorry i'm just reading quotes at this point because again not much happens in this book and i hope this is interesting to at least someone but one of the things that he says about fit says about regal is never had i seen accoutrements before that spoke so garishly of expense and so little of taste oh my gosh i love that quote i literally said that a few weeks ago to a friend of mine about not about a specific person or everything but I think that is indicative of like fashion today how like it's all about being loud rather than just like being a bit subtle with certain things we then get introduced to a plot point around how there's some kind of skirmishes happening around the land and Verity and Fitz have to go to visit one of like the lords um, to talk to him about protecting the watchtowers because the watchtowers aren't being manned properly. And that's partly why these skirmishes are happening, right? Because nobody's actually guarding what they should be guarding. They go to this lord called Kelver and this is kind of Fitz's first test of his skills and to see you know, is is he able to actually like change the course of events? Because at the point that they go to see Kelva, the situation isn't good. Like he's very defensive. He, the, uh, the other lords don't think that they should be having to partake in watching the guard towers or the watch towers because it's not their land, blah, blah, blah. You know, everyone's being very selfish basically. And his role is to go and like observe, but also try to influence how the conversation goes. And ultimately what happens is he ends up talking to Kelvar's new wife and she saves her dog, I think it is. And because he saves her dog, 
he says to her like look you need to tell Calvar to man the watchtowers and that's exactly what happens he does end up doing that but there's some really interesting observations that Fitz has about certain characters about the food about how there's just like ostentation for the sake of ostentation how the food there is a display of good food abused in the name of fashionable cooking like the reason why he's able to see Calvar's wife new wife is because he's hungry because all the food that he's eaten is like fancy tiny finger food but in reality he just wants some bread and soup <laughs> like i just think it's so funny he's quite humble in a way we get uh some more interesting perspective from Fitz fitz's perspective about certain characters he talks about trade and he said i simply did whatever trade told me to do and trusted to him to have it turn out right my spirit rode high on the crest of that wave of faith and sometime during the night it occurred to me this was what Burrick had gotten from chivalry and what he missed so badly and it's interesting to see how that faith also starts to deteriorate as he gets older and as he matures by the time of the end of the book it hasn't completely deteriorated but we are starting to see him question certain things we're starting to see him become more of a man even though he's still like very young right but he's starting to see things in a slightly different perspective by the end of the book and i think that's very telling of his growth and where he might end up in the later books as well. We then get some interactions between an, a character that I haven't talked about yet, but is definitely one of my favourite characters up there with Verity, and that is Lady Patience. Lady Patience, oh my gosh, such a great character. She is Chivalry's wife, and the interesting thing about Lady Patience is that Chivalry married her out of love it wasn't out of like political machinations or anything like that he married her because he loved her when Fitz kind of gets you know passed over to the kingdom he kind of assumes that his father and his wife i.e Lady Patience like hate him and that's why they don't interact with him but Lady Patience ends up coming to court and initially their first interaction is obviously quite awkward she's quite brusque she's very opinionated like even though that's not her son she does still see him as a son and she still wants him to be presented well he, she wants him to learn the art and to be you know a well-to-do man she very much wants to propel him forward but like i said their first couple of interactions are a bit awkward but then we start to see them spend more time together and it just becomes the most beautiful friendship and I'm very excited to see how that progresses. You get that with other characters like Burrick and Chade and Verity as well. But I think it's it's an, it's a different dynamic, right? Because she is a woman and because she's almost like a motherly figure. Then we're going to keep going. There's one quote after Fitz gets the puppy where he says, For a very brief period, I was happy. And an even rarer gift, I knew I was happy. So beautiful. And it reminds me that like those little moments of happiness, we might not necessarily get them as much as we want to, nor do I think we should get them as much as maybe we think we should, because I don't think we should be happy all the time. But I think there is a really beautiful thing when you you feel like content and you feel happy and you're aware that you're happy. Like I think that should be celebrated and should be noted. So beautiful. We then get a whole thread around Fitz learning the skill. Now the skill is this ability to kind of communicate with other minds and to be able to kind of like not manipulate but if you're good at the skill like you can change what someone's thinking you can get them to do something without them realizing it so it's like this kind of telepathy kind of thing you can communicate with somebody else through the skill if they kind of have the skill and are trained in using it it's like a very important skill to have right and and Fitz has to learn how to use the skill and he then kind of gets put under the tutelage of a guy called Galen and Galen is like the head of the skill masters that's not what they're called but for lack of a better word and through that experience of interacting with Galen he gets extremely extremely kind of downtrodden because Galen treats him terribly and the reason why he treats him terribly is because he is a bastard and because he is and because he's also good friends with Regal and I think them two together obviously kind of talk about uh, Fitz in a really negative way. One of the things that Fitz says after like the first session that he has with Galen is it was the idea that they were all paying for my transgression. I had never felt so shamed in my life because they're all he and a bunch of others are learning together. He ends up messing up and Galen ends up whipping um, the other people as well, the other students. And the thing about Fitz is that he takes so much responsibility for things that are happening that are out of his control. And I think that just goes to show what an honourable character he is, because when things are going wrong, he is 
and they're not even his fault, he's still taking responsibility over them. And I think that comes back to what happened when he was a very, very young child and he kind of overcompensates, I think, which is really sad to see in some ways because obviously that is not his fault. He then goes through like multiple kind of classes with this guy and every single interaction he has with him is really horrible. Galen is awful to him. Like I genuinely think he's quite an evil guy. Like you wouldn't treat children like that if you weren't evil, in my opinion. Like he's really, really horrible to everybody, particularly horrible to Fitz for the reasons that I gave earlier, but he's just so cruel and there's absolutely no need for it. And Barak actually has something to say about this. He says, very little worth knowing is taught by fear, Barak said stubbornly and more warmly. It's a poor teacher who tries to instruct by blows and threats. I totally agree with him. Another really great quote that we get is, nothing takes the heart out of a man more than the expectation of failure. So good. As, as part of his lessons with Galen, they actually get put to the test to see whether they're able to use the skill, right? And that will determine whether they then become a part of like the entourage that use the skill to protect the kingdom. And they get given a test. And in that test, they're basically taken out to some random part of the kingdom. And they have to last like two or three days. And they have to be able to communicate with Galen via the skill. If they can't do that, or if they die, obviously they fail the test, right? And they'll be kind of shamed for that. And as he's in his test, Fitz kind of knows that he's probably being set up and he's put near the forge. I haven't actually mentioned the forge yet, but the forge yet is where like there are a bunch of people who've essentially been turned into like very inhuman versions of, them of themselves. Like they've lost all ability to kind of empathize and they just kind of kill, right? And these are just normal villagers, right? They they turn into these beings and by becoming these beings, they like lose all their humanity and they are near the forge. Fitz is well aware of this and he knows he's been set up because he's been put next to the forge. And as I've just said, he knows that there are those kind of beings that, I forgot the name of what they're called, but they're there, right? And while he's there and while he's waiting to get contacted by Galen, which he suspects won't happen anyway, he gets this kind of vision of Burrick being stabbed and Smithy, which was the puppy, also being stabbed. He gets the sense of like something isn't right. Now, we don't know if that's actually true what's happened. We don't know whether this is just like a dream or a nightmare. I did think that maybe Galen had tricked him into thinking that so that he would have rushed back to town and then probably die on the way. But it turns out that that's actually what happens. Burrick does end up getting stabbed. Smithy does end up passing as well, which is really, really tragic. We end up learning that it was actually a character called Cobb. And Cobb is like the, the right hand to Burrick and he hates Fitz because he's very jealous of the attention that Burrick gives Fitz. So there's like so many layers of like what's happening, right? And he ends up doing that for Galen, if I remember correctly. We learn that later on in the book, but the point is, is that he then kind of gets into a panic and he wants to get back to town as soon as he possibly can. He ends up coming across those beings that have kind of lost their humanity and he ends up uh, making his first couple of kills. And he says, I had felt nothing for them when I killed them. No fear, no anger, no pain, not even despair. They had been things because they've lost their humanity and he's trying to defend himself. We then get him back. We're coming up towards the end of the book. He then gets back to the town and Burrick is hospitalized and Smithy is dead, which is so tragic. Burrick says something really interesting to Fitz. He says, I know what a dog can be to a man, but you don't throw your life over for a, not just a dog. I cut in almost harshly. Smithy, my friend. And it wasn't only him. It gave up the weight and I came back for you. And again, it kind of reinforces that Burrick, something's going on with him. Like, I, I feel like he's speaking from experience, but I hope we'll learn more from that. He's quite emphatic about continuing on his relationships with these animals, but Burrick is so against it because he's so, I think it's because he's so scared what will happen to Fitz when, if and when he gets found out. And he says to him, I'm done with you. And I just, I wrote in my comments, sad, because it, it's so sad. I think... Burrick, in many instances, has been like a father to Fitz. So for him to lose that fatherly figure is really tragic, in my opinion. We then get a really nice interaction between Verity and Fitz. And he says to him, he basically gives him his full name, which is Fitz Chivalry Farcia. And he says, stop thinking of yourself as the bastard Fitz Chivalry Farcia. I just think that's so sweet. Like he says it quite forcefully, but I think he's trying to instill a bit of confidence into Fitz. And I think that's so lovely. And I think at that point, their relationship really starts to change and we really starts to see him almost adopt him as a child, which is so nice. 
On the topic of Verity, I, again, uh, the more he speaks in this book, the more I adore his character. He talks to the king and he's being forced to marry for political reasons, obviously, and they are forcing him to go like to a different part of the land, which is going to take him days. The issue is, is that Verity is basically guarding the waterfront because he's able to stop the ships from coming into the towns or at least minimise the amount of ships that are coming into the town. So it's really important that he keeps doing that. If he goes away and starts travelling, he's not going to be able to do that. And the problem with that, though, is by using the skill more often, you're also damaging your body. He kind of wastes away as he's doing this. And so he's not also strong enough to even travel. And he's especially not strong enough to travel and do the skill at the same time. And there's this really touching thing that he says that I, I found kind of my heart bleeding out for him. He says to his father, already all the work I did last night while you slept and Regal danced and drank with his courtiers is coming and done while we stand here and yatter at one another. And I think that just shows like he has this real sense of responsibility for his people, even though he's not king yet. Like I think that for me is like the true sign of a king that he's willing to sacrifice to an extent slightly frivolous things like going to a marriage ceremony to protect his people. Like that's ultimately what he's there for, or what he thinks he's there for. And he takes that responsibility very seriously. It's such a breath of fresh air to read a character like that, because often we get a lot of characters like this kind of, kind of like the prince in waiting or the king in waiting and they're horrible which is what we get with regal but i think verity is is very an, is very much an honorable person we then get fitz going on this journey to i forgot the name of the kingdom but he ends up going to meet with verity's new wife he's going there again for particular reasons he's going there as a spy as an assassin he's been tasked to assassinate the new queen's brother He's going with Regal because Regal is going to be in the ceremony on behalf of Verity's behalf so that he can continue to protect the coastlines. Fitz is going along on that journey. And one of the many things I love about Fitz is how observant he is. Like he picks up on a lot of things that don't other characters don't pick up on. So as an example, one of the courtiers that goes along with Regal, I've forgotten his name. He's so kind of ignorant of the customs and the cultural differences between Verity's new wife and their own whereas Fitz he's very aware of like what is happening and he's very aware of what's happening and what's going on I think that's partly because of how Chade has trained him but I think that's also partly because he's a bastard and his his role is relegated to being at the back and behind everybody else and you're kind of forced to be observant in those situations we then get a bit more reflection from Fitz about Verity's wife um after he's met her she's kind of quite a fearless individual quite strong she's very young though very inexperienced and he says he would respect her i knew but was respect enough between a king and his queen and i actually wrote in a note i hope this is a really good marriage because i think verity deserves that and obviously this young woman deserves that and yeah i, I think we see signs of the goods of their marriage but there's also potential friction by the end of the first book as well he also talks to katrickan i forgot her name but i remembered it now and he tries to kind of not sell verity to katrickan but he wants to like give a more honest version of what he's like rather than regal espousing lies about him and he says he gives up the interests of a man to fulfill his duty as a prince not through a coldness of spirit or a lack of life in himself like what a nice thing to say about someone. <laughs> he also shows that he can be a bit dense sometimes. One bit that he says, for the life of me, I had no idea what goal might be served by making Katrickan so dread Verity. Because Regal has been saying horrible stuff about Verity to Katrickan to put her off him. Because I think ultimately he wants to marry her, right? And that was kind of what I'd guessed before that actually becomes revealed. But I think, come on, Fitz. I mean, I know he's only like seven or eight at this point, but like, come on, my dude. Wisen up a bit, like, use your brain. <laughs> but then he is a child, but I don't know, like, you, like be smart. Think, try to understand other people's motives, right? We then kind of get one of the big incidents of this book where he gets poisoned because they think which he's going to poison Kutrika's brother, which he was actually tasked to do. But he doesn't end up doing it and he ends up getting poisoned because they want to kill him before he has the opportunity to kill the brother. This kind of instigates a whole bunch of different events. Regal tries to set him up 
and make him out to be the bad guy that ultimately fails he actually ends up becoming quite sick after getting the poison in his system i'll come back to that in a second like another quote that i really liked was you have heard perhaps that the jampei way is that the ruler is the servant of his people it does show that there are some cultural similarities and political similarities between kind of verity and then the jampei people because he has a very similar attitude as well so there is a sign there that the marriage between the two of them might be good but still too early to see whether that will actually be the case. We then get Nosy back and Nosy ends up being Katrickan's brother's dog. Burrick ended up sending Nosy off to him and it's so lovely to see that there is like a recognition between Nosy and Fitz that they acknowledge that they had this kind of partnership when he was a lot younger. When he dies it's so so sad because he ends up losing him for a second time which I think is so tragic. We then get a really interesting comment from Katrickan. She says, I'm pledged to the six duchies to be their queen. I'm pledged to their people tomorrow. I pledge to the king in waiting, not to a man named Verity, which I always thought was really interesting. And that again, kind of highlighted to me that something is going on here, not necessarily from her perspective, but something is afoot. And she is also smart enough to not pledge her allegiance to one person. But that also shows that Regal is really trying to position himself as the future king in waiting. I'm going to fast forward through this bit now. Burke ends up getting injured when they try to go to Regal. Regal ends up hurting Fitz very badly and ends up like chucking him into the like baths and he almost ends up drowning. Nosy ends up pulling him out of the baths. He's really sick though. Like Burke gets is like near death but he ends up getting saved again he heals relatively quickly in my opinion but Fitz gets really really sick and they end up having to delay their departure back to their home because he's not well enough to travel and I'm at this point I'm like not that far into book two but we're we're, we're seeing how that poison is impacting Fitz and it's really really had like a, a terrible impact on him we don't know the extent of the damage or whether it will ever really go away but like it's really really impacting his body like he's getting these seizures and it's it's really really horrible it's great that obviously Barrick lives but then obviously we get the the reflection from Fitz that Nosy is dead when he wakes up and it's like even though he's you know, Burrick is still alive and he has that relationship and friendship still alive. Like he's still losing something that is almost quite intrinsic to who he is, which is these like animal companions. It's just really, really sad. Like, I feel like we're probably going to get more animal companion deaths, but I really hope we don't because I just think it's so sad. It's so hard to read, to be honest. But I'm glad that Burrick lives and I'm glad that their relationship at this point, at the very least, continues to be somewhat nice. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Like I said, not a ton happens in this book. Not a ton of stuff is really going on. I mean, there's obviously stuff that happens, but I really think this book is about like Fitz and building him up as a character, getting a sense of the lay of the land, building up people like Verity and Burrick. Because I think these characters are going to play really important parts later on in the series. I really, really hope that we get more Verity. Like I really adore his character and I really hope we get more Lady Patience as well because I adore her character the Galen does end up getting killed which I was really happy about because I think he's an awful person and he deserved to die like it comes out that him and Cobb partnered together to, to kill Burrick why though we don't know yet we don't actually know why they tried to kill him that is part of like book two we've got a bit of reflection from Fitz and he's trying to to kind of piece together why they tried to kill him we don't have the answer to that yet but I'm really curious to find out I do like how Fitz is wising up and smarting up and yet he's still very fallible though he doesn't pick up on everything because he's still very young and he's still very inexperienced but we're seeing him grow into a person that I think we kind of all want him to become right overall I'm, I'm going to stop it here now because I think I've been talking for over an hour I, I hope this was enjoyable but I thought this was an amazing book I loved it it was a five stars one of my favorite books of this year for sure and one of my favorite fantasy books of all time for sure and I'm just so excited to see where this story goes let me know down below what were your favorite parts from book one please do not spoil the future books please like I really do not know anything about this series my hypotheses and my theories 
feel free to kind of like add your little comments, but please do not spoil it because I do not want this to be spoiled for me at all. I'll see you down below in the comments, folks. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. This is a long video and I'd really appreciate it if you do give it a like and if you do share it, comment down below. Um, it'd be really nice to talk about this book with you all. Thanks for watching. Stay safe, take care, and I'll see you very soon. Bye.